They had to take a few uh, case scenarios of things that might happen in the church, conflict resolution type things, and uh, they talked about uh, ways in which they might be able to uh, help those things, look at Scripture and, and thought, well, how, does, uh, how do we view this situation through Scripture? And uh, I thought it went really well. Uh, it was a challenging thing for them. Uh, this year, uh, on a similar uh, note, they had a similar opportunity and project to participate in. This weekend, if you're not familiar, uh, is our leadership initiative uh, for our young men. Uh, the Young Men's Leadership Initiative. And so what they did was had an opportunity to hear from Spencer Ross. Uh, he brought four great lessons on, uh, that covered the topic that was uh, of a book called The Sons of Dust, written by one of our brethren, and a great book. And the, the subtitle of that book is The Roots of Biblical Manliness. Uh, the Roots of Biblical Manliness. And the challenge of, it, of growing up and, and to the men that God wants us to be. And so as they studied those lessons and, and thought about uh, those lessons, they're going to now present to us uh, from their perspective with an aim at how we might better be able to help them and encourage them in uh, becoming the men that God wants them to be. One thing I'd like to say, I'm really proud of all the work that they did uh, and the things that took place in less than 48 hours. Um, they had to digest all this information uh, that they received, work together at various times. Uh, they're worn out. Uh, a lot of that's their own fault uh, for, for staying up late, but uh, having a good time. But also, just lesson after lesson, group discussion after group discussion, they were very, very fruitful and uh, proud of them. No matter how this portion goes, appreciate the work that you put in and uh, really, really looking forward to, to hearing the things that you all have come up with. And I know uh, we'll all be blessed by it. Uh, our first group that's going to come, uh, Tyler, Carter, and Isaac have uh, put together uh, this one. Carter's going to come to us now. This weekend, we were uh, blessed to be part of a great experience that Corey put on, and Rusty, and the Routens, and the Shastas, and as well as others cooking and stuff for us. Uh, it was fun as well as challenging. We had many topics to discuss, and some things were more difficult than others. I think as a, as a weekend... Uh, as a group, we all came together. We learned more about each other and kind of struggles each and every one of us deal with every day. And I think that helped us grow together as a youth group and as young men. Um, as Corey said, we learned about the Sons of Dust book, which helps us prepare ourselves and prepare others on how to be a man and, uh, according to God's Word. Um, we, uh, we learned and helped examine ourselves and as well as helping, hopefully, to teach others how to prepare for the future, how to prepare your kids and others to learn how to be better men according to God's Word. This morning we'd like to, to invite you to open, your work, open the Bible and discuss with us and give you some insight on what we learned this weekend. In order, to be, or in order for a man to know who he is, to be, he got, he, he's got to reconnect to his cre creator. In today's society, the world is becoming more corrupt, and what we are seeing is that men are not filling the godly roles that we are appointed to them. You look at the Bible built in Ten or Texas and Tennessee, and you see man many congregations without elders or deacons. Many men today are not accept, or accepting their responsibilities. Inspired by, God, inspired by God, they are not being how God designed us to be. 44% of kids in single parent homes live in poverty. Only 12 in a married home live in poverty. The root to all issues are break, breakdown in authority. One of the things we were given along with this book was a, uh, a paper. After every lesson we did with Spencer, 
we had some discussion topics that we split off into our groups. And um, I've picked out two or three of the questions that, that were just really, they just really stuck out. And I think they need to be, to be brought up in the church. Number one, discuss the way the media present men. How do TV shows and movies represent men? Specifically, how are fathers portrayed? Compare and contrast God's perspective of men with the world's perspective. I like this one. When, when, we, read, when we were going through this, this was in uh, lesson one, so we did this Friday night. As soon as I read this, I mean, it was pretty easy to answer. I have uh, three little brothers, if you didn't know, and we watch some TV, um, like Disney Channel, Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon. Something that, that really stuck out to me was something that my mom said. There are certain TV shows that we're not allowed to watch, specifically for this reason. And uh, she'll walk in the back door, and if she sees it on, she'll say, turn it, because that dad is represented as an imbecile. We're not, we're not going to watch that. It's just, you know, as I'm growing up, I remember some of the shows that I watched as a kid and some of the shows that are on now, and you can see it just getting progressively worse and worse in uh, today's society. And, you know, watching that kind of stuff on TV as a little kid is, it is an example it sets an example for them, and they think that it, that putting homosexuality in these TV shows and putting, making the husband, degrading the husband, it, it puts it in their mind at such a young age, and it, has, it lets them grow up with it. And you know, that in itself isn't a sin, but if they grow up with it and accept it, and it becomes part of them, if they accept homosexuality and things of that nature, it, it becomes a sin. Next question. Read the first full paragraph on page 70. Read that and consider the aggressive and courageous spirit associated with manliness. Is this a positive attribute? Why does it seem to be missing in the media's portrayal of men? I'm just going to to read it. It's, it's pretty short. In 1955, Ossifer Joseph Dorbeck entered a contest held by BEAT magazine to create a new motto for the Los Angeles Police Academy. His motto, the winning entry, was simple, to protect and to, preserve, and to serve. The motto was quickly adopted by the Academy and later became ubiquitous in the department as a whole <clears throat> when it was placed beside the city seal on patrol cars, to protect and to serve. While originally only the model, motto for the Los Angeles Police Department. It has been used by law enforcement officers throughout the United States. So, read and consider the aggressive and courageous spirit associated with manliness. Is this a positive attribute? I believe it is. Um, why does it seem to be missing in the media's portrayal of men? One of the growing um, What's the word I'm looking for? Customs? I don't, I don't know. I, I forgot the word, but something that the media is really focusing on these days is the feminism aspect. And part of the way they do that is they degrade men down to women's standards almost, or maybe even past them. And that's not the place that God has given us in the Bible. We really need to, to focus on that and stand up and voice our opinions. Thank you. As our group closes, we hope and pray, our prayer was this weekend, that you as grandparents and parents will continue to encourage your kids, encourage your grandchildren to become better men of the Lord. 
now David and other groups will come up and hopefully bring more insight and more ideas. So the whole leadership initiative was about being the men we were called to be, getting back to the roots of biblical manliness. And that was actually part of the title of the book that we got. It was called Sons of Dust, The Roots of Biblical Manliness. And throughout the book, it talks about, you know, it goes through Genesis chapter 2. It does well talking about the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. And um, it shows the original character that, that God instilled in man. And in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 2, it talks about how whenever God gave Adam the Garden of Eden, he worked it and he kept it. So we're, we need to work. Obviously, we're called to work. That's the one thing that is necessary for being a man. And keeping what is given to us, making sure keeping it up and keeping it thriving. And then in verse 24, it also says that man is instructed to leave his mom and dad and stay put with his wife. So... We're called to become married and, and have a wife and a family and, uh, and leave our parents. Don't become dependent on, on parents for the rest of our lives like some, some men are. Um, other things in the Bible that, um, that talk about what we should be whenever we become men is um, integrity and character. In, in Proverbs 10, 8, 9, 8 through 9, it says, the wise in heart will receive commands, but a prating fool will fall. He who walks with integrity walks securely, but he who, walk, who perverts his ways will become known. So we need to walk with integrity. And then also respect. We need, every man needs to have respect. Matthew seven twelve. that's the golden rule, obviously. Do unto others as you have them do unto you, for this is the law of the prophets. And being committed and faithful in 1 Thessalonians 5.24, it says, He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it? And so we need to be faithful not only to our wives, our families, our, our jobs, the church, and the Lord is also faithful. That, that is one great thing that we need to understand, that one of the great, greatest or the greatest example of being a biblical man. I know that God's not a man, but he is, he's better than the purest man. He is the number one. He's the alpha. And, uh, and we need to strive to be just like him. And the Lord is as faithful and as loyal as he gets. Um, being humble, listening, uh, having that confidence, all these things can be found in the scriptures uh, of what men are called to be doing. But our culture, it usually calls men to be uh, one of two extremes. One of them is like, it's called machoism. You know, it's like being the big, strong guy with a big beard and, and just asserting your dominance anywhere you go. You got to make sure that people think that you're just awesome. Just not, not through uh, leadership, but like through, through scaring people, you know, just, just trying to be, you know, ugly and mean. And then the, the opposite end of the spectrum would be emasculation. And the actual definition of emasculation is uh, to deprive a man of his role or identity. And, and right now you see that, I mean, especially, I mean, it's very obvious whenever you see that in, in homosexuality and, and the, the men that become, uh, that they're transsexual. And, uh, but, but also less prominent, that, or that's not so obvious, uh, but you, it's, actually, it's actually, you see it a lot, um, is like, on TV and stuff, whenever it shows men being not really the leaders, the followers they should be in their in their household, they're just kind of like a bumbling fool, you know. Who, what did I do, and and stuff like that. And then it just it, it makes men out to be like they're not they're not smart, they're not um, good leaders, and they're just there for the money. They have no emotional support for the family. They have no spiritual support for the family, and. And this is hard for, for us teens right now because, like, I mean, through social media and TV and everything like that, we're surrounded by all this, and, and we see it all the time, and, and we see the, the machoism and the emasculation. I personally see, I see the, the machoism mostly in, in school. And, uh, like, like, kids, I don't know why they, they think that 
that fighting, you got you to gotta call somebody out and fight them. And if you win, you're the bigger man. And honestly, it takes a way bigger man to, to not fight and, and to talk it out. But it's just that machoism mentality that, that just it ruins it. And really, the number one reason that I can see of why kids start acting like that and why teens will, will be so aggressive sometimes uh, is because of the, the father figure in the family. And um, that role that the ch kids see you know, of their father figure, they, it's amazing how much kids will take after their dads, sons will take after their dads. And I really hope I take after my dad well, but some of them, it's like I've met some kids' dads from my school and it's not, it's not a good situation there. And um, that's why fathers need to be like the lighthouse of the family. They need to be the person guiding their kids, uh, not only towards, you know, being the provider of the family, the keeper of the family, the rock, you know. They need to guide them towards God. They need to guide them towards the church and make them uh, become successful uh, members of the church and members of society. And that's why we need to also, whenever we grow up, us men, and we become, you know, family men and having kids and stuff, we need to be godly men ourselves, but we also need to lead our children to want to be godly men and make their own families. Thank you. Just wanted to, to say one thing is, um, the different groups were given the opportunity and uh, you know hey you're and and so one of the neat things about watching them work is seeing the way the different groups did work uh, as a different group dynamic and uh, they had an opportunity uh, so um, not everybody's going to make a preacher uh, not everybody's going to to make even a bible class teacher uh, but given them the opportunity and they participated in, in different events and different activities one of the things that they had to do uh, was called one minute speeches and every single one of them had to had to get up in a topic they did not know and they had to speak for a minute uh, on that topic but you know they did did things like that but I just wanted to, to point that out you know Colin and Trey and David uh, in this group as they worked together and, and presented these things and, and came together and, and David uh, was a spokesperson uh, did a great job they appreciate that you guys did a great job and love to see how that worked I look forward to seeing now we have two more groups and, and see how uh, that dynamic worked and look look forward to hearing from you uh, y'all know next Brody and, and Mixon and Parker, uh, we're together here and we're, we'll hear from them now. All right, hello. First off, I want to say thank you, Corey, for letting us teach the morning class. Um, thank you all for showing up. Uh, first off, I want to say things are changing, and they're changing at an alarming rate. Uh, you know, the world's a lot different than it was 5, 10, maybe even 15 years ago. Things are getting rough. We're going to go through the next rough couple, you know, four or eight years. Either way we go. It's not going to be easy. And the values that we hold dear to our hearts, they're being attacked left and right because they're not seen as what's needed or they're outdated. But, you know, we see the increasing of homosexuality, the, like, degradation, de <laughs> the degradation of... Uh, I guess, morals that would hold the country together. They're being attacked by the media, um, TV. The overall image of a man has been attacked multiple times. I'm, seeing, like, I'm sure you've all seen this on TV, The, the Fool. Um, you know, any, any, I guess, decision that they make is always going to be attacked by someone who doesn't agree or just because of the fact that they are a man. So... I feel as people of the church, it's our job to step up and lead and be a light through these next coming years, be an example. Show them that although the church has been here forever, it will remain here forever. I'd like to start off uh, saying that our culture, or culture in general and history, has always changed. It's always a changing thing. But God, he's, he's a never-changing being. He's a never-changing never father. And we, we as men of the church, should also be the same. Never changing in our morals, in the way we live, in the way we live by God's word. 
but culture has also changed the way they look at men. They look at men as untrustworthy people, maybe liars, just a all-around shady person, a lazy person. There's a lot of ways to describe how they look at men, but how we should be as men of God. We do not need to succumb to that. Our culture is wrong because what we hold our beliefs in is the Bible and God's word. Um, as God's men, we need to have integrity. We need to be courageous. If God is for us, who can be against us? We also need to be able to listen to other people and have respect. We also need to no humility, something that we always forget, and we're human. We're always going to mess up. We're always going to fall. So we need to desire to do better. Um, the lessons that were brought to us, he had an A, B, C, an acronyms. The first one was analyze your culture. We analyze our culture. It's uh, always changing how it looks at men. And then B is back to your roots. Hold to our foundation morals that we've been taught on. And then C is create the right environment. As men, we're the leaders of the church. We need to set the example to the young men and the children that are coming up. And in doing so, we need to show them through our actions that we're not like the world around us. We're not like the culture. We're a different person. We're men of God. In, in 1 Corinthians sixteen thirteen, it says, Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, and act like men. Be strong. So we need to be strong for the congregation and for the young ones coming up and for ourselves and our salvation. I'd like to start off by really expressing my thanks to, uh, to the congregation this morning by allowing us to um, teach this class by revamping what we've learned this weekend and it's a lot of great stuff and I know it's kind of coming to an end this class is but uh, just like to say thank you again um, I'd like to really hit on two main points that we learned this weekend the first being the the three kinds of man that this world is in need of <clears throat> the first man is a father the world is in need of fathers. Someone who is able to raise their children to become godly people, who sets the example that he is a godly man, that, that, um, that he can teach his son to, to, uh, to, to become a father someday and to raise his children as, as uh, godly people, and who can raise their daughters to become wives of of great husbands who can raise the children to become godly people and who can also raise the children to become godly people. Um, kind of leads into my second point, uh, needs grandfathers. The world needs grandfathers. Men who, uh, who have more experience than the fathers, who are maybe a little more wiser, can, can, uh, can help the father to raise his children who can set an example to the father by when when he was a when the grandfather was a father uh, learning how to become a father a um, couple of verses to emphasize on these two points I don't have enough time to read through them I'm just going to list them for y'all to if y'all are taking notes to note them down for the father Ephesians 6 verse 4 and then the grandfather, uh, Proverbs 17, verse 6, Proverbs 16, verse 31, and also Proverbs 13, verses 22. 
Titus 2, 1 through 2, and 2 Timothy 2, verses 2. Now the third man is church leaders. The world is in need of a man who is willing to step up and really, you know, if so, come out of their comfort zone to step up and lead the world to a right, the right direction. And um, that is a, today it is a, a big point of emphasis that we need to really, to really work on is leading the world and uh, being church leaders. Uh, two verses that kind of hit home on that are Ephesians 3 verse 10 and Acts 20 through 28. Now my second point is we, uh, we learned how to be uh, faithful men and how to be the right man and we also learned how we need to treat women which is I think is a is a big point we need to learn. If y'all will, please turn with me to uh, 1 Timothy 5, and I'll be reading the first and second verse out of that. <clears throat> the writer says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, and the younger as sisters, with all purity. So it, it kind of describes how we should treat, you know, our, elder, our elderly man and the, uh, the men who are our same age as brothers. Likewise, the elderly women as our, our mothers. We should always respect our elders. No matter if we have a conflicting problem with them, we still need to respect what they have to say and and really really take in what they're saying and and learn from them. And and likewise with treating our um, the women that are our age as our own sisters. It would uh <laughs> It, it's kind of a running joke that it always makes me mad when a guy is, is uh, talking to my sister. And it, we should really do that, especially with our sisters in Christ. And, um, but any, any woman that's our age, we should treat with the most respect we can. Thank you. All right, so as Tyler pointed out earlier, the motto of most police forces around this nation is to protect and serve. And I believe that goes for the same of the men of the church. It's our job to stand up, set the example, and be leaders in the church. We're here to protect the church, and we're also here to serve the gospel of God. That's our job. Now, society doesn't want us to do that at this point. They see us as old and one-minded. They forget the example that we've led. They forget the country that we've built. And the only point that I have to that is a quote that Spencer said that uh, you know, sticks with me is, uh, don't compromise your morals just for the sake of society's convenience. If we let them open the door and step on one belief that we have, that opens the floodgates. And next thing you know, we're just like them. And in today's society, there's no room for God, unfortunately. So it's our job to step up and make sure he has room to set the example, and to be leaders, to be warriors with a soul. You know, man, I'm calling on you to step up and lead. It's, you know, set the example. Make sure your kids have something to follow and make sure their kids have an example to follow. We need to make sure this church stays. We need to make sure that the examples that we have set will continue. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, we hit four points that I want uh, or hope that we can take away from this. My first one is to be consistent man of God. So never be changing with our culture. And our second point is church needs leaders, 
that are good fathers and grandfathers. And even if you're single, be a leader. We, we always need leaders. Whether it's an elder or a deacon or just a mentor in the church. Our third point is treat women as sisters. Women, you have a role, a very important role to play. Unfortunately, I don't, we don't have enough time to go into that right now. And our fourth point, we need to be men that will serve and protect and hold true to our roots. Thank you. Good morning. Um, as our group, I've been asked that I give a special thank you to Corey and the families that prepared our food this weekend. It was fabulous, and if you weren't there to get some, then you are out of luck, I'm sorry to say. But then we'd also ask a special thank you to the congregation, not only the men, but also the women, because y'all are mothers, y'all are fathers. Y'all are the ones that give that road and that path to the ones like the ones up here as ourselves. This morning, we want to follow a certain path, a certain kind of outline that we had this weekend. And as uh, Parker said, it's A, B, and C. But we want to take a little bit of a different road. So starting off with A, we wanted to talk about just a few problems in our current society that challenge young men like ourselves. One of the things that I learned in our leadership initiative or is the problem that we have of sexual desires. That's a subject that we don't like to talk much about because it's personal and emotional, but one that we definitely need to address because we live in a world that opposes us directly. It can come in many different forms. We need to respect God's creation and use that in the right way. And another one is peer pressure. I have gathered two verses that I'm going to explain, and it's about peer pressure. And if you want to turn with me, you can. First one is Proverbs 13, 20. And it states, he who walks with wise men becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. What this means, if you walk with the wise, that you will be wise. And that if you hang out with people that are bad, that you'll be bad. And the other verse is Ephesians 5.11. And it says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. And this means that if you're doing bad stuff, don't do it. Matter of fact, tell them that you're doing bad stuff with them, that they're also doing bad and that we should correct it. Our third point on letter A is being immersed in a world who does not love God. Every day, men like ourselves, including the ones in the audience this morning, you are forced to see and say and think certain things to help others feel better about themselves. Whether it be good or wrong, you are forced to do things that God asks you not to do. Specifically, he tells you not to do things and think certain ways that our culture and our society forces you to think. And that is a problem. And we choose sometimes as Christians to say, be a better person, do not stand up, do not say certain things. But it comes to a point where you are pushed around so much that you have to stand up for your beliefs. One specific thing is when the woman that decided not to give that marriage um, papers to the couple of the same sex, and she stood up for her belief. She said, that was wrong, and I'm not going to do that. That is my job, and I have the choice to make that happen. And she made a stand. And what happened to her? She was ridiculed. 
She was named names. She was hated on by different groups. And that's just, that's just one picture of what happens to Christians or ones of like beliefs when we stand up for what God asks us to stand up for. Then that, that brings up a different point. Look at what Jesus did in his life. The Pharisees, the Jews, he stood up for things and it got him crucified. But he did what was right. And God said, it is better to be challenged in this life than to agree with the world and live like them. We are called to live in the world, but not live of the world. We are called to be different. So that leads us to our different, our, our next letter B, and it's how our challenged lives, when we are challenged, how it affects y'all. Thank you. One of our duties as Christians is to teach the ones and the younger ones before us how to follow Christ and to serve God in their lives. We can do this by setting a good example, but we need to do right to set that good example. Mark 9.42 says that, uh, But whoever causes one of these little ones to stumble, who believe in me to stumble, would it, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. As Bertie said, we need more church leaders and father figures for us and little, for everybody to look up to. What we do not only affects ourselves and our relationship with God, but the ones who, the other Christians around us. And another point is, when we do wrong, we discourage older generations. What this means is, when we do wrong, we know we have done wrong, but it makes like it makes older generations feel like they taught us wrong and that they messed up when we messed up. Our third point on letter B is, we talked about it as a group in the in the little game room, and we thought about what our third reason should be, and we, we came up with, it's a two-way street, as in, we have failed each other, physically and spiritually, and I'm talking mainly to fathers this morning. I know we, as men down here, we are not perfect, but we know that when we mess up, it is disheartening to our fathers. But another problem that we, that we talked about was, when we mess up, fathers also, and I'm talking to women here, Fathers also have a feeling of they have let us down, as in they have not led the right life that they should be to show their sons, and they have not given the best example. I am here to say that is true, and I hope you fathers are listening that we understand that y'all feel that way. And it, dri it drives me crazy inside to know that my father has set a certain extent a certain standard for me to live by, and God has too. And if we put it in spiritual terms, we have failed God when we mess up. We are no better than the people that put Jesus up on that cross. But that is why Jesus died on the cross, so that we have a chance of forgiveness, to turn around our lives and to repent of those wrongdoings. So now we, we go to our final, our final letter, and that's going to be C. And it's mainly towards the audience on how... Y'all can help prepare the men down here to be prepared in the life that we are fixing to live after high school, after college, and during those years, how y'all can help us. Actually, it's Dalton, so I'll go. All right, so firstly, when y'all prove to us that the Christian life is the greatest life to live, not one outside of these doors, but the life that God has called us to be. When y'all live that life and y'all are happy and y'all are joyful, even through trials and tribulations, when y'all are happy with each other and sisters and brothers in Christ, when y'all have that, that joyment, knowing that God is on your side, we as men, we see that. But when we see fathers and we see mothers that are discouraged and never happy and always sad and something's always going wrong and always blaming God, it makes us look and like, is that really the life that I want to live? 
And so I'm not saying be joyful all the time because that is impossible. There are trials and tribulations, but we are asking that you have a joyful heart. You explain to us and y'all tell us how good being a Christian is. The love that God shows you in this life. And also how y'all can help us is more talking like friend to friend instead of parent to son. What this means is if you talk to us like you're our friend, we'll understand it more. And it's easy for us to feel like safer and not being like we're getting argued at. Uh, One of the ways I think that we could better learn and be helped by y'all is to understand the differences between our generation and the others out there. Things that are prevalent today, like release issues and gay rights, were probably a lot more uncommon 15, 20, 30 years ago, but they affect us because of the wisdom that we lack. So with those three points, we don't, we want it to be sincere and we're not jabbing. Those were not jabbing remarks. But we are in a changing society. My dad tells me all the, every day how back in his day, whether how long that was, most all families around his community, they all went to church. They all went to worship on Sunday mornings. They all got together and had Bible studies. They hardly ever heard of gay people in their schools. They hardly ever heard of riots going on the streets about gay rights. And it really proves a point of that's what we deal with in school every single day. That's what we are faced when we go eat pizza at Pizza Hut and what's on TV. There are so many instances of where our generation is going downhill. And that's why I believe Corey has decided to have this leadership initiative is to train us men up here to fight that, to stand up with God for God, to announce our beliefs, and those beliefs should be in the direction of God and His love and His mercy. One of the other points was that was brought up is Christians, especially Church of Christ Christians, are one minded. And that we judge. And the only people that are going to heaven are us in this room. That is, that is not true. What we do judge is their actions by God's standards. Not their heart. Not their mind. That is God's job. And God says he will judge that in the end. We are called to be loving people. We are called to be leaders. And mainly this was about men in the church and men in the world and becoming those certain men that God calls us to be. But women, y'all listen to. Like Parker said, y'all have a role and we do not have time. But if you go in Proverbs chapter 31, it talks about a virtuous woman and the roles that y'all play in our lives. And we've been in Proverbs for I don't know how many years. Hannah can tell you this too. That's what our Sunday morning class with my dad has been ever since probably my eighth grade year. We've been in Proverbs this whole time. We're finally in chapter 31, but it is so prevalent. I'm telling you what. Every day is something new. Every, every Sunday morning. And it, it applies to every aspect of our lives. Every single verse, you can apply it somewhere to your life or your future life. So with those three points, we ask that you help us in learning and help us in leading and being those, those men that we are called to be and holding us responsible and helping us be accountable for our actions. One of the last things that, as, as a group here, that we want to say is we really look up to our older ones. Our generation, some now say that, oh, they're just old people. You know, they don't know anything. I'll tell you what. I've learned more from my granddad and grandmother and my the my granny and papa charlie's in in kansas more than i'll ever know from a friend or something of that sort y'all know a lot 
And we ask that you share that knowledge and you help us when we, when we lead and when we grow. Several of us here sitting today, we're fixing to go off to college and we're fixing to be gone and put out into the world and not under the house of a father. So in closing, will you all pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have this morning to gather and to look into your word and to learn more about you. Heavenly Father, we ask that you take what we have said this morning and you help it apply it not to the men up here, but also to the men and women in the pews in front of me. Help us learn. Help us to be coercive and work together in building each other up in Christ and in our lives outside of these doors. Heavenly Father, we ask that you help us not just remember it for a few days or a few weeks but we remember these days and the words that have been said for years to come. Help us apply it to our lives. Help us to apply it to our families when we have them. And more importantly, we're thankful for your son's death that makes everything here possible and the blood that ran down. Heavenly Father, we ask that you be watchful over us and you be watchful over the ones that are not as lucky as we are to have circumstances of this sort. All these things we ask in your son's name. Amen. And you